Hi, I'm Jennifer from Shabby Fabrics. This is part two of our Christmas series. In our first video, we covered how to make the Dresden wreath quilt behind me, and today we'll be going over the English paper piecing ornaments. They are very popular right now. English paper piecing is trending, and I thought, what can we do for Christmas with English paper piecing? Well, we came up with some fun projects, and I'll go over that with you today. We're using the Essential Gems 2.5-inch strip pack from Wilmington Fabrics. We were able to make the ornaments and the Dresden wreath out of just one packet. It's 24 two and a half inch strips. Super convenient. You're not cutting all those strips and beautifully coordinated with a variety of textures and shades of greens. I just absolutely love it. Now there will be a free download for this project on the Shabby Fabrics homepage at the very bottom. There's a link that says free downloads. Just click there and we'll have all of the specific products that you would need to be able to make the ornament. So don't worry about writing any of that down. I just want you to watch the process of how it happens. So when you get ready to maybe have an ornament exchange with work or maybe friends, I like making new ornaments for my Christmas tree a couple every year. It's just special. It's just special. Um, and especially if you're crafty, um, which you obviously are, you wouldn't be watching the video. How fun to be able to make an ornament versus go buy one that's mass produced. So let's get started. Oh my gosh, I love stuff like this. I love little crafty things. So the first thing that I recommend that you do once you decide on your greens, if you're going to get the Essential Gems pack or use your stash, whatever you decide to do, I like to use a little bit of sizing in my fabric. It just makes the edge that I'll be showing you turn under and stay there better. So what do I mean by that? And I'll be using a ceiling iron today. It's just a small little convenient iron. I like to use that sometimes instead of a big iron, especially when I'm working with small projects like this. If you don't have a ceiling iron, just get one. You're going to see me use it so many times. Um, and it has a rheostat too. So even if you are working with some finer fabric, silks or whatnot, you can just dial that down and you can still use that iron for projects that use those finer fabrics. So I'm just going to use some um, sizing on that and I'll go ahead and just dry that. I'd like to do that whenever I want a nice crisp edge. You'll see why I'll be doing that here shortly. Now, of course, we used a variety of different shapes. There's the templates and then there's the papers. When you get the templates, they have a paper backing. I wanted to show you what they look like with and without the paper removed. You can leave this paper on. It helps to make better contact and not slip around on the fabric. But let's say you're going to fussy cut something. You have a specific motif you want to cut out of a fabric. You might want to peel that paper off so that way when you put your template on, you are actually seeing that fabric and you're able to just fussy cut that exact spot. So just know that you do have that choice. The templates do become a little bit stickier, just a little bit, I shouldn't say stickier, slipperier um, when you put that onto your fabric. So just know the paper does give a little bit more of an adhesion, kind of more of a grip than when you take it off and it's just the plastic on there. Um, just wanted to mention that. Love the spinning mat. You're going to see why. Um, first thing that we're going to do is, of course, bring our fabric to our spinning mat. And I have my template here. And I have a good, sharp rotary blade. If you don't have a good, sharp rotary blade, just get one. You need a nice, clean cut. And this is why I love this mat, is I'm just going to start cutting. And then I just rotate that mat. I'm not lifting anything. I'm not making any dangerous cuts. I can let go of that template, just make that little rotation, press right back down. Okay, and we'll turn one more time. And now we have a clean cut. Consequently, you don't have to cut one at a time. Cut two, three, four layers, whatever you're comfortable with. Again, that's where a nice sharp rotary blade is going to be able to plow right through four to six layers of fabric potentially and save you time in preparing your um, fabrics for this process. So that's just a time saving tip that I've learned. Um, so beautiful product that the convenience, the accuracy, safety, spinning mat, get one of those. Nice sharp rotary blade, another great um, key to what we're doing. Now I'll actually just be working first with the hexagon. That's so very straightforward. So you have 
the Stoline glue pen. I love this. I found it recently. With traditional English paper piecing, traditional English paper piecing, you would position this here, fold this edge over, and with needle and thread, you would actually secure the fabric to the paper and continue doing that all the way around with a running stitch. You would continue doing that for your shapes and then you would sew them together with a little tiny whip stitch and then remove the paper later. Oh my gosh. I want the project done today. So we're gonna go with the quick approach method and this is where the sew line glue pen comes in. Just give a little bit of a glue right there and you're just positioning this to be having the equal amount of seam allowance all the way around. That makes sense. We're just gonna put a little stripe of glue and with my fingers, I just bring it over. And you'll just continue like this around the horn here, around your shape. Now, this part is fabric. I go ahead and put a little bit of glue on that because I want that corner to be secured as well. So don't be afraid to put a little bit of glue right onto that fabric in that corner right there. And we're gonna go all the way around, okay? And you can see now why I brought that sizing in. I just want a nice crisp edge. I'm gonna do something else with the ceiling iron in the very end and it'll help kind of seal this all in. Let's close that final side together. Everything's there, and that's when I like to just take this to my iron. Okay, I like to just make sure that edge is so crisp. Now, you could keep the papers in here if you wanted to. Just know that when you get ready to either hand sew or machine sew these different sections together, like this, right in your shape of your wreath, that you'll be going through paper and fabric. You can do that. It's not like you're going to wash this. But if you want to, you don't want to be going through paper, you don't like that stiffness, you can go ahead then and just lift that up. Keep in mind, you've used sizing and you've also used um, a very good press. That will remember where those folds were. And we're just going to go ahead and kind of just Get that paper out, trying to disturb this, the other sides as little as possible. Now that's a pretty darn good glue there, so it doesn't always want to release. So that's another thing. If you know you're going to take the papers out, use as little glue as you need to, because it'll make it a little bit easier for the papers to come out. Now let's get that last one out. All right. And you kind of have to form it. See how the creases were formed? That's because you used that sizing. And now you just kind of go back, get those sides back down. That's where this little iron is just so handy for little projects. You can see exactly what you're doing. Now with my big iron, which of course I use plenty, it's so big, I, I kind of can't really see what's underneath that whole big plate. But with a little ceiling iron, I can really get in there and see exactly where I need to be. And then I'm just going to press it down again and I'm ready to go. So you get the idea. Um, what we've done is prepared our seven sections ahead of time. Um, we did go ahead and remove all the papers. Now you have a choice here. You would lay all of your seven out. I don't think I have seven here, but at this point, you would either place right sides together and hand sew this with a whip stitch. Okay, and I've done needle and thread. Um, and this one, this one has the paper in there. That's okay though, I can still get in there. And I am just picking up the very, very tips, the very top of that. And I'm just gonna continue with a stitch that's running just like this, it's called a running stitch, all the way down. And then you leverage that open, you put the next section in, same thing, right sides together, whip stitch, and you continue around the horn. That's option one. I like speed. <laughs> I have so many projects that I want to do. I like to get things done a little bit quicker and I like to use the threads and technology that's out there. So you could also use a coordinating thread. This is a masterpiece thread. This is color 133. Um, this in the top, that in the bobbin. You could place this right sides together. And again, you're just running a zigzag where you're just catching that edge and you're going to keep going around the horn. That's another option. Or let's say you're doing a really colorful wreath where a one color of thread is not sufficient. 
You could always use the monopoly. This is a polyester thread in the upper part of the machine and the bottom line in the bobbin. Now the bottom line in the bobbin, this is so fine that I have found that a smoky gray works on anything. I do, so you don't need a whole sewing room of different bottom line color threads. The smoky gray is going to be, it's almost invisible. So this would be more than sufficient to grab just those two. And you could also just do the clear thread. So those are your options. Now with the, once you have your two halves, because each ornament is double-sided, right? Just like on a Christmas tree, those things can spin. So we made two halves and we went ahead and used the Roxanne's glue baste it, put little drops of glue just in those little sections. And we went ahead, you get the idea, and we positioned, make sure that the same fabric's over the same fabric, and we just positioned them together like this. Now, if you're gonna be putting an ornament hanger in, just make sure you grab some gold ribbon, grab whatever length you want, and just insert those ends in there so it's kind of trapped in there. You don't really have to do anything after this point. You don't have to sew those edges down by hand if you're using the glue because it's gonna hold until you wash this. Well, who's gonna wash this? You, you wouldn't do that. So you don't have to secure that edge down. But again, if you want to do that, or maybe a cute decorative stitch, you could use the masterpiece and coordinating colors, a sulky that you might have, the bottom line clear, and then the monopoly on the top. So there's some options there. And then of course, just the buttons. I wanna show you, that's all there is to making this ornament here. I wanna show you something unique about the ornaments that are in the diamond shape. There's something unique about that that's just a little bit different. Here it was very easy to see how everything's tucked in, but with the diamonds, it's slightly different. So I wanted to go over that to make sure um, you know the process to that. Let's go over this process together. Okay, so we've already cut out our fabric and now we have our diamond. Same story, let me get my glue pen. Let's put that on there. We don't need our rotary cutter anymore. So let's put that over there. Couple options here. I want to show you both options. I'll show you one option on the end and one option on the other. Think about a gift, a, a present. You bring the side up, right? You put, you've already wrapped the paper, but then you bring the sides up and fold the sides in, right? The flap up and sides in. You have that option here, of course. You could put a little bit of glue here and bring this point over like so and then bring those sides up. There is more fabric going on at the point. Sometimes, because that fabric might be getting in the way ever so slightly of the next flap coming over, I might trim a little bit of that away before I bring that next flap in. So let's try that, putting some more glue, and we'll bring up that side. Okay, and now what I, what I like about this is everything's tucked in. Nothing's gonna come apart over time, nothing's gonna fray because that flap came up and the sides came in just like a present and everything is secured. It's not quite as exactly pointed because I have more fabric going on here, but it's not gonna come undone. And you can kind of just fuss around with it until you get it almost almost exactly pointed i'm just going to trim off a little bit of the excess of that fabric right there okay option one i told you i'd show you both options the other option i'll show you on the other end you would bring this flap over like this all the way and just pull that over you could even use an iron if you want to kind of really get that in there and now i'm going to bring glue here and I'm going to press it back. And now this is gonna come back over this direction, like this. But I've got this thing hanging out here. Well, what I like to do in that instance, I'm coming in with my scissors very horizontal and making that cut right there. Now, it, the only thing I don't like about that is I have a raw edge right there. That's where Fray Check comes in. Fray Check is your friend. 
If you don't have this in your sewing basket, this is like sliced bread, just get some. It's wonderful when you have those little areas of vulnerability where you need just a little bit of reinforcement and to know that that's not going anywhere. Fray check is not water soluble. Um, if you were ever to wash, let's say you use this on a quilt, it's not coming out. It's not like this, this which is water soluble. This is forever, be careful. If you get this on your clothes, you're not getting it out. Um, that's been my experience anyway, unless you know a trick, I've never been able to get it out and I just kind of trim that. And, and the advantage to, the advantage to this end, which has, you can see this is more pointy and this is a little more blunt. This is tucked in, it's not going anywhere. This edge is more pointy, but it had to have fray check. It has to have a little bit more care because it is an area of vulnerability. Um, but you know, if you're going to bring things to the center and cover it with a bow, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to worry about that fraying out because it's going to be covered with a bow anyway. So that's all there is to making these adorable ornaments. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see the rest of the Christmas series.